Hi and welcome to Cost Accounting. Today we're going to start Chapter 4 and we're going to take a look at job order costing and process costing. Um, job order costing is what we were working on. That was Chapter 3. Uh, we talked about creating a pair of Levi's jeans and then stopping and creating a different kind of Levi's jeans, a different size, a different style, needing different parts. Um, and those were jobs. Uh, now we're going to look at process costing. And process costing has to do with items that are very much the same or exactly the same. Uh, you can often call them homogeneous, which means that they all have the same thing. The beginning of your chapter starts with talking about paper towels, and they're talking about bounty paper towels. Um, and they say the way they make them is they make a really big 2,000 pound roll, and then they um, cut it down and make it into little uh, paper towel rolls that we are used to that we use in our kitchens but that every single roll is exactly the same um, whether the the job or the package of bounty paper towels is going to Walmart or Target or Dollar General or Giant Eagle or Shop and Save it doesn't matter they're all going to be exactly the same so with process costing we don't really have a job because everything is the same and we can apply the costs across the board. Um, there are some similarities between job order costing and process costing. They both have the same purpose, which is to assign material, labor, and manufacturing overhead costs so to products and to provide a mechanism for computing unit and product costs. Um, both systems have the same basic manufacturing accounts, including manufacturing overhead, raw materials, and work in process and finished goods. So remembering that raw materials, work in process, and finished goods are inventory accounts. And they follow the cost of manufacturing through basically, basically the same in both systems. There are some differences. Um, and here's some differences in this exhibit 4-1. Um, a single product is produced either on a continuous basis or for a long periods of time. All units of the product are identical. Costs are accumulated by department and unit costs are computed by department. And that's different because in the job costing, as it says here, we would do it by a job and we would have job costing sheets. But now we're going to have processing departments and we're going to collect the different costs in the processing departments. A processing department is an organizational unit where work is performed on a product where materials, labor, or overhead costs are added to the product. So it's a processing unit and it would have things added to the costs. Um, they give you an example here of a brick and they also give you some examples of potato chips down here. So we start with our raw materials, the basic potato. Um, we process um, and clean the potatoes and then we take them to the processing department for cooking as you can see the potatoes cooking and then they get cooked and they're take to the processing department inspecting and packing where we put our chips into a bag and when they're finished goods they're bags of potato chips on the shelves but this potato preparation um, cooking and inspecting and packaging all represent different processing departments and they could have their own work and process accounts, their own um, uh, labor will be associated, um, and materials will be associated into their own work and process account. And then these costs may move, so the cost from the potato preparation might be moved over here into the process department for cooking. And finally, it'll all go over to the inspecting and packing to where it finally becomes finished goods, and that is our completed product that we are willing to sell. So we're just accumulating costs in these products for work and process, and eventually it'll all go to finished goods. Um, if we take a look at the next table here, it's a T account, and they're trying to talk about that same type of flow. You can see that we have raw materials, wages payable, and manufacturing overhead. And we have two process departments. Instead of being cooking and inspecting, here they're calling them A and B. Raw materials, wages payable, and manufacturing overhead can flow into both of these departments. But then you can see A flowing into B, and the 
expenses from B and A flowing to finished goods and cost of goods sold. So kind of like trickling, kind of looks like a little waterfall here. Taking the materials, the wages, and the overhead into the work and process to finished goods to cost of goods sold. Um, on page 145 and page 146, they show you the journal entries. And they're very similar to what we did in the last chapter. You can see raw materials being moved from raw materials to work and process. But here we have two departments, formulating and bottling. This example is for cream soda, which is very yummy. So you can see we're going to accumulate some costs in formulating and some into bottling. And again, here we have labor costs. So we have work and process for formulating. And if we go to the next page, we can see that we have the work and process for bottling. Another thing that's interested here is that we're moving costs from one department to the other. So on page 146, you can see here that we are uh, crediting the formulating department and that we are debiting here the work and process bottling. And that makes sense because in formulating we're making the cream soda. So we're putting together the ingredients, the water, the acids, the flavoring, the sugar. That's formulating. And then we have to put it into bottling. So we're going to say I'm taking it out of work and process formulating and then I'm going to put it into work and process bottling. So work and process bottling is being debited while work and process formulating is being credited. And that makes sense because this account is an asset and it's going up, and this account is an asset and it's going down. And when assets need to decrease, we credit them. Here you can see again the work and process bottling, which was our debit in the other one up right here, being credited because this account is now decreasing as we move the work to finished goods. And finally, the inventory is sold. When the inventory is sold, we no longer have it. We need to decrease, decrease finished goods with a credit, and we're going to recognize the cost of the inventory. Remember, because of the matching principle, we want to recognize the cost of the inventory at the time of the sale. Um, next, we want to talk about equivalent units of production. And, uh, yep. So we're on the right page. Here, it's um, equivalent units are equal to the number of partially completed units times the percentage of completion. So what happens is sometimes uh, materials and labor and everything is being assigned to work in process, either um, you know process A or process B. It doesn't matter. And they don't become completed. They're still being worked on at the end of the period. But they're not really uh, zero, but they're not really a complete unit. So what we need to do is we kind of figure out equivalent units. Uh, equivalent units is the product of the number of partially completed units and the percentage of completion of those units. Um, roughly speaking, it's the number of complete units that could have been obtained, but they're not quite done. In this chapter, we are going to use the weighted average method. Um, in the appendix, they discuss FIFO. Um, but here, with the weighted average method, we're going to take equivalent units of production equal to units transferred to the next department plus the ending work and process inventory. That allows us to take into account the fact that those aren't at the same price, and we can weight them. Um, when we look at the chart on the next page here, we're looking here, we're starting with beginning work and process 200 units. We start 5,000 in May, and we transport 4,800 into the next department. So we have 400 left. They say, how much are complete? Well, um, we have 55 and 30 here at the beginning. But notice here, this 4,800, they're 100% complete. And that makes sense because they're done. Um, and then we have the ending work and process. 40% is done and 25% is done. And when we see the word conversion here, what we're talking about is labor and overhead. Remember that there's three pieces that go into the product cost, direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. Conversion is a word we can use to mean labor and overhead. Here, if we scroll down, we can see another chart looking at the equivalent units of production. So it's using the same numbers. We're transforming 4,800 materials, 4,800 conversion. The ending work and process, we're going to take materials times the 400 units times 
in conversion 400 units times 25 percent. We'll get 160 for materials, 100 for conversion, and we'll add them together. This one here, Exhibit 4-5, is similar to Exercise 4-2 that you'll be asked to complete later um, in the videos. We'll have different videos. And that completes my discussion of the beginning part of the chapter. Um, I encourage you to go ahead and reread through this part of the chapter. I, you were supposed to have read it into your homework. So um, please make sure that you go back through and you read this section. Um, and right after this video, there will be three more videos. One for Exercise 4-1, one, one for Exercise 4-2, and one for Exercise 4-3. Please watch all the videos so that you're able to complete your homework um, and bring all of your homework, the homework that was due today and the homework that will be due on the next day to class with you when I see you next week. Um, or no, not next week, when I see you on Thursday. So thanks and have a good day.